welcome to Fertility and Sterility on Air, the podcast where you can stay current on the latest global research in the field of reproductive medicine. This podcast brings you an overview of this month's journal, in-depth discussion with authors, and other special features. FNS on Air is brought to you by Fertility and Sterility Family of Journals in conjunction with the American Society for Reproductive Medicine and is hosted by Dr. Kurt Barnhart, Editor-in-Chief, Dr. Eve Feinberg, Editorial Editor, Dr. Micah Hill, Media Editor, and Dr. Pietro Bordaletto, Interactive Associate-in-Chief. Welcome, everyone, to Fertility and Sterility on Air. I'm Micah Hill, the Media Editor, and we're in the March 2024 edition, Volume 121, Number 3 of FNS on Air. And today's crew, I'm joined by Kurt Barnhart, Kate Devine, and Pietro Bortoletto. Good morning, friends. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Hi, everybody. Good to be back. Eve's not with us today. She sends hello to all of our listeners. She's uh, waking up this morning in Las Vegas, having just uh, finished the Super Bowl a couple hours ago. So Eve, we miss you, but uh, hope you had a, a great time. So we're going to dive right into the editorial content of the journal. Uh, we start off with our annual thank you to the reviewers uh, of the journal for 2023. And obviously, our reviewers are part of the backbone of uh, the integrity and the quality of the journal. Kurt, did you have anything that you wanted to say as far as uh, to our reviewers? I'm just continually impressed on how complete and thoughtful the reviewers are. We have a wonderful group of reviewers. Thank you all very much and keep up the strong work. That's what makes our journal so strong. Excellent. If you're a listener and uh, don't review and would like to, please reach out to us because we'd be happy to sign you up. Uh, one of the great things about this list is you can look down it and see someone who you know is a first year fellow. And then right after them will be someone who's been in the field for 50 years who's still contributing. So seeing the, the depth and breadth of our reviewers is always a wonderful thing. For our views and reviews this month, that's led by Anuja Dorcris, uh, who is one of our editorial editors. And uh, she writes about mental health disorders, should we screen all of our patients? And she talks about how one in eight people will suffer from some uh, mental health disorder. And that's essentially the similarity to the prevalence of infertility. But it's not just fertility that's associated with these mental health disorders. It's things such as PCOS, endometriosis, fibroids, other gynecologic diseases. Uh, and so she has a group uh, of five uh, experts that lead five different articles uh, that cover sort of the depth and breadth and especially look at newer modalities uh, that can be used to help uh, clinics uh, help their patients through their mental health journey, uh, whether it's on the GYN side uh, or on the infertility side. So definitely a, a great set of articles worth reading. Our inkling this month is from editorial editor Peter Schlegel. He asks, are we giving patients the wrong instructions for semen analysis before ART? I think we all know that uh, the semen analysis is defined by WHO and it reflects fertile men, not necessarily infertile men. And the timing of two to seven days of abstinence really is just based on trying to standardize the collection process. You could standardize uh, sort of the 95th percentile of those things, but the, that isn't necessarily designed for uh, infertility or for fertile sperm collection for our uh, fertility procedures. Uh, he talks about that longer periods of abstinence may increase uh, DFI uh, and argues for potentially having timing of uh, sperm collection be a day or even within a few hours uh, of abstinence for the egg retrieval. So some very interesting data. And finally, to end our uh, content before we get to the original research, there are two ethics opinions from ASRM. These are both great. The one in particular that I was drawn to was ethical obligations and fertility treatments when intimate partners withhold information from each other. So it goes through the weeds of various scenarios where uh, one partner may, may be withholding information that causes harm to the others. And when not only is it okay for you as a clinician to decline care, but maybe when it's even uh, appropriate for you to, you're being put in an ethically, uh, an ethic quandary. So uh, very much worth reading. So that is the front matter, the editorial matter in the journal for this month. And we're going to dive right into the original research. Kate, you have the seminal article of this month. We're diving into COVID and ART, a very timely topic. Yeah, I, I was going to say exactly the same thing, Mike. I took the words out of my mouth. COVID, you know, continues to be a timely uh, topic, though we wish it, it were not. Um, and so, you know, 
uh, still 3% of deaths in the United States, according to CDC statistics, are, are due to COVID, which, you know, shocked me to, to learn. Um, and still a, a big impact on our, our day-to-day lives. So thankfully not what it was in 2020. Um, so this paper entitled Impact of COVID-19 Vaccination on Live Birth Rates After In Vitro Fertilization is by Dr. Jerry Applebaum and co-authors from Penn um, and Amherst. And they evaluated the association between COVID vaccination status and outcomes from both fresh and frozen embryo transfer. And so they used a reasonably large cohort of 1,358 fresh and 687 frozen transfers that occurred in 2020 and 2021. And they defined vaccination status as two or more doses of Pfizer or Moderna vaccine or one dose of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And they did pretty rigorously um, ascertain vac- vaccination status. They excluded donor cycles and cycles where the vaccination status could not be ascertained. And the primary outcome was live birth. So we love that, following embryo transfer. Um, Secondary outcomes included positive HCG, clinical pregnancy following embryo transfer, as well as for the stimulated cycles, number of eggs retrieved, maturity, fertilization rate, and blastocyst utilization rate. Fertility preservation cycles were also included in the analysis of these latter cycle characteristics and outcomes. Generalized estimating equation modeling was used to account for potentially confounding variables, including age, AMH in the stimulated uh, cycle analysis, race, PGT status in the FET analysis. And GE was also used to account for multiple cycles or transfers within the same patient. So thankfully, uh, the authors found no statistically significant difference in any outcomes following fresh embryo transfer comparing vaccinated versus unvaccinated individuals in the adjusted models. Um, and these, the model adjustments were really uh, very much called for in this cohort because of note and, and perhaps somewhat unsurprisingly, vaccinated cycles occurred among older women with a lower AMH and AFC and who had more prior cycles uh, than in the unvaccinated cohort. So you might argue that in some ways, they represented a poorer prognosis group. Conversely, they were more likely to undergo embryo transfer over the study period, and unvaccinated cycles occurred earlier in the study period with a median start date of August 2020 versus January of 2021. The unvaccinated cycles also occurred among women with a higher BMI in the fresh transfer cohort, and they were less likely to use PGT. So some of these um, potentially confounding variables could cut both ways. Somewhat surprisingly to me, vaccinated patients were found to have a higher probability of achieving pregnancy, clinical pregnancy, and live birth than their unvaccinated counterparts with an adjusted odds ratio of 2.3 and a 95% confidence interval of 1.6 to 3.2. The authors conducted secondary analyses without PGT and among patients who were vaccinated within the cycle that was being considered. And they also found no difference in their analysis in these secondary analyses. Their findings were unchanged. So in conclusion, the authors found no difference from fresh transfer. They concluded improved and, and relatively markedly so improved outcomes from frozen embryo transfer among patients who uh, received full vaccination. Appropriately, they advise caution when interpreting these findings with regards to the FET outcomes, emphasizing that given the retrospective nature of their analysis, there may be factors present in the vaccinated group that favored better outcomes and for which their study could not account. You know, we, we can think of things like socioeconomic and educational status, et cetera. That said, one other possible explanation that they also dive into pretty deeply in their discussion is that the the other possible explanation is the elephant in the room, COVID. Uh, Maybe these patients were more likely to have a live birth because they didn't get COVID. So it, it speaks to really the benefit of this vaccine, both in terms of pregnancy outcomes and health outcomes overall. So they conclude the data support vaccination in patients planning ART and contradict prior unsubstantiated claims 
And I think uh, some of the folks, uh, some of our co-hosts here were part of really important committee opinion that our field came out with early on, saying that the claims that the mRNA vaccine could reduce or interfere with implantation were completely bogus. So um, more evidence of what our patients need to hear, you know, still the authors note that as recently as February 2023, 31% of patients attempting pregnancy were unvaccinated relative to 12% of the general population. So some people are still worried about this and, and declining vaccine because they think it's going to hurt their chances. I'm interested to hear, Micah, Kurt, and Pietro, do you see this still in your populations? Do you, do you still have a hard time getting folks to get vaccinated and uh, you know, I guess a, a kind of a bigger question, and, and we may never know the answer, especially given the waning immunity associated with these vaccines and even with infection, but do you think we'll ever achieve herd immunity, you know, for COVID-19? A lot of great discussion there, Kate. And, and you know, in my patients, it's the military, so we don't really have a say what what vaccines we get. And so our partners who aren't active duty tend, tend to also be um very willing to to get vaccinated. So we have not seen it as an issue in our patients. Uh, Kurt, Pietro, are you still seeing it? Not seeing it as much. It's it's interesting that um, as the politics of all have kind of waned, uh, COVID has kind of become part of, a, you know, like a flu or an epidemic. For example, just last week, we were all asked to wear masks again in the clinic and nobody cared. And, and the reason was because it was just everyone was getting the flu and sick. So, um, if people are really strongly anti-vax at this point, they're not raising their hand and making a big deal about it. I have the benefit of working down the street from Moderna, so I've seen a lot of those folks that work at the places where the vaccines are made, and Pfizer's just not too much further from that. So I think the population in Boston is pretty uh, pro-vaccine, so I don't have to really twist their arm or convince them. I think whenever we're talking about COVID, though, it's always important for us to acknowledge when the data uh, says that we are right, but also important to kind of acknowledge the stuff that people care about and where the data kind of proved us wrong. One of the big things that patients always ask about is, does the COVID vaccine mess up my period? And I think there's been a lot of data over the last few years that it does transiently change your period about one to two months, and then it returns to baseline. And that transient change in your period does not affect your future fertility, does not affect your ability to become pregnant in the short or the long term. Uh, but I think the minute you acknowledge, yeah, the vaccine is going to have a little bit of an effect. Uh, but big picture, it seems to be safe, seems to protect you and your fetus in pregnancy um, and does not affect your ART outcomes. I think that's always a net positive and we should highlight that and scream it from the rooftops. I, I wanted to uh, congratulate some of the co-authors that I work with on this paper was really well done. It's a shame that we had to do this study, though. It's it's kind of it's kind of um too bad that we have to dispel myths rather than let the science come out first. But congratulations to you know taking this on and giving some real quality evidence to show that some of the myths we did come up with uh, were just simply not true. I really appreciated the authors, as Kate pointed out, being careful in um, their interpretation of the beneficial effect of the vaccine and uh, acknowledging that that might be due to some sort of confounding or something else uh, in, in the data. But at a minimum, there's certainly no harm. And if there's any chance of benefit on something patients should be doing anyway, uh, I, I really thought this was great data. We're never going to get an RCT on this so that this may be a, as good of data as, as we're going to have. So. Very good seminal contribution to the journal this month. Pietro, the theme, if there is one for this month's journal, is adenomyosis. So you have a couple of articles on that. We're going to jump over uh, to you. Listen, as a guy who does a lot of endo, I also have, by the transitive property, have to like a lot of adeno. And I'm glad to see some data uh, to kind of support some of the counseling and some of the, the gut feeling I've had about adenomyosis. Adeno is one of those conditions that's really started to meaningfully enter, I think, public consciousness in the last decade or so, uh, particularly as it relates to fertility and its similarities to endometriosis in terms of just the pathophysiology and our treatment options. I think part of this is driven by just improved imaging techniques and greater familiarity with a lot of the diverse phenotypes and presentations and localizations of the lesions. But once present, adeno can really wreak havoc on symptoms, but also on fertility. It does this in a couple of different ways, uh, local immunologic changes, local hyperestrogenism from overactive aromatase enzymes within this, these adenomyotic implants, certainly changes the contractility of the uterus periimplantation and alters local gene expression periimplantation. 
Well, nothing about traditional ovarian stimulation overcomes the intrinsic issue with adenomyosis-driven infertility. Ovarian stimulation in and of itself, particularly the associated hyperestrogenism, may further uh, enhance some of these deleterious aspects of adenomyosis as it relates to implantation rights. One thought that's been proposed recently is utilizing a freeze-all strategy to mitigate some of the risks of excess sex steroid exposure compared to a fresh transfer approach. So that's exactly what the authors in this FNS study entitled The Freeze-All Strategy Seems to Improve the Chance of Birth in Adenomyosis-Affected Women, led by first author Mathilde Burdon from Paris, France, and senior Arthur Charles Chaperon, the godfather of endometriosis and adenomyosis research. They conducted a retrospective study from 2018 to 2021 at a single IVF center in women under the age of 42 undergoing IVF and ICSI with imaging diagnosed adenomyosis. And this was where they utilized both MRI and ultrasound as acceptable modalities, and the diagnosis was made by radiologists, not by gynecologists. Patients either underwent fresh blast transfer with vaginal progesterone and luteal E2 support, or they underwent hormone replacement FET with or without downregulation, but also allowed for patients undergoing stimulated transfer cycles with FSH, natural cycles, or even the modified natural cycle with ovulation induction agents. Primary endpoint of this study, like Kate said, was thankfully cumulative live birth and was utilized and analyzed using logistic regression to identify variables that were independently associated with cumulative live birth. In total, a small study, 111 women with ADNO underwent fresh ET up front, and another 195 underwent frozen ET up front. The vast majority of these women had diffuse adenomyosis, whereas 43% had focal adenomyosis, and only 3% had adenomyomas. There were no differences in the distribution of adenomyosis between both groups. Both groups are largely similar aside from the freeze-all group having a couple of important differences. One, they had more previous IVF cycle attempts, they had higher AMHs, and they had a higher proportion of patients with concurrent endometriosis. And that's important because a lot of people view endometriosis as just a spectrum of adenomyosis. Kind of same disease, same pathophys, just presenting in different tissues. But we'll get back to that later. With regard to IVF cycles, not unexpectedly, the PK2 levels were higher in the frozen group. They had more eggs retrieved in the frozen group. And duh, more blasts in the frozen group. Interestingly, there are not significant differences in pregnancy rates or live birth rates when comparing fresh ET versus frozen ET. However, big takeaway of the study was that cumulative live birth was significantly higher in the freeze-all group compared to the fresh group, 44% versus 30%. However, in multivariable analysis, the freeze-all strategy, having at least one top quality blast and women's age were all independently associated with cumulative live birth. Now, if you're paying attention, you probably have some questions regarding the study findings. The decision for freeze-all up front or conversion to freeze-all mid-cycle was up to the physician. So one, of course, could reasonably infer that better prognosis patients vis-a-vis -vis higher E2 levels, higher number of developing follicles, may have all been likely counseled towards uh, a frozen transfer approach. Second, the frozen embryo transfer protocols utilized were all hormone replacement cycles, by and large, without downregulation. And I know many of us have started using um, six to eight weeks of Lupron downregulation with or without letrozole to knock down that intralesional aromatase activity. That paradigm was not the standard evaluated in this study. However, I think it's uh, at least in North America and certainly in my practice is becoming increasingly common for patients with known adenomyosis. Ultimately, I think a randomized study is going to give us a definitive answer on how to best manage the embryo transfer cycle in patients with adenomyosis, but it's uh, the question for me isn't so much fresh versus frozen, because I think fresh is just becoming increasingly out of date as we all move towards frozen anyway. What I really want to know is once I have a frozen blastocyst, what's the most effective way to get that embryo back into the uterus while minimizing medication costs, minimizing the six to eight weeks of downregulation, and even having to use oral or injectable uh, GnRH class medications. And I would be remiss if, as a surgery person, I didn't mention that there's actually a couple of surgical options that are being evaluated for adenomyosis, specifically radiofrequency ablation um, for focal adenomyosis, for adenomyomas, and even diffuse adenomyosis as a way of kind of knocking down some of that enzymatic activity of the lesions while preserving um, the, the uterine musculature. This data is forthcoming. There's a lot that's going to be looked at, I think, in the next year or two. Um, there may be a role for surgery in this disease uh, beyond just kind of the big triple flack techniques that are big wax to the uterus. But I'll shut up for a second. I, I, I don't want to march too much onto surgery. Micah, Kate, Kurt, when you guys see a patient with adenomyosis in front of you, 
How are you counseling them about fresh versus frozen? Do you have a, a preferred approach or does this study inform your practice? I mean, I think, I think the weaknesses of the study are those that you highlighted and obviously retrospective study with decision-making on the part of the practitioner uh, make it a little bit hard to uh, generalize the findings to one's individual practice. That said, I think um, the decision towards freeze-all in the overwhelming majority of cycles is kind of a, a, an unstoppable train. So um, that might not be the actual primary question for most of these patients. And I couldn't agree with you more that what we really need to start looking at and you know, near and dear to, to my heart is optimizing frozen embryo transfer protocols for specific patient cohorts. And so adenomyosis is definitely high up there on the list given what we know that the disease does to prognosis. So whether it is natural cycles versus programmed and whether we do need some kind of a GNRH modulator and advancer that might help patients very much remains to be seen. For now, I, I wouldn't do it you know, empirically. Uh, we need to do the research um, and find out, does this help these patients? I, I agree with that, Kate. I think that I think it's it's a little hard to interpret this data as definitive. I think we've now found a new way of identifying adenomyosis, and therefore all of the tools at our disposal are being thrown at it and suggesting that it works. And I'm I, I'm certainly sensitive to the fact that people with adenomyosis may have a slightly different prognosis, but we have the same hammer and nail approach to it that I'm not convinced is actually making a difference. Years ago, we used to suggest that endometriosis should be treated differently until we realized that treating it differently with long-term suppression was getting in the way of other things like age and time to pregnancy. <laughs> so um, I just, I wonder if it's going to kind of go down the same pathway because we clearly are in a resurgence now of papers that are finding adenomyosis and finding suggestive ways of treating them, but I haven't yet seen them really definitive. So we need much more, much more personalized approach. My comment is more on the uh, statistical methods side of this. So, Pietro, you sort of hinted or got to it that there's certainly probably some confounding here by by what the cohort is. The freeze all patients or FETs are more likely to be good responders, as evidenced by they had a thousand higher estrogen on average and three more M2s on average. So then you look at where does the difference come from? In the first cycle, there was no difference statistically in outcomes. It came over cumulative cycles. Well, is that because the freeze-all does better per transfer, or did they have more transfers? So it wasn't statistically significant, but they had 0.2 on average more uh, transfer cycles in, in the freeze-all group. Out of 195 patients, that's 39 extra transfers they had. And if they had a 27% baseline live birth rate, which is what they had, that's 11 extra live births just because they had 39 extra transfers. If you take those 11 live births out, there's not a statistical difference between the two groups. So it might just be that cumulative was because they had more transfers. Now, it reduces the effect size by about half. So it goes from like 14% better to maybe 7% better. So I think maybe the study, just because of its design and cumulative, overestimated what that is. But I think there's probably still some effect there. So I'm being nitpicky, but I think that confounding uh, between the two groups helped drive some of the results here. And to just kind of add to that how I counsel my patients before the study and how I will continue to counsel my patients afterwards is that there's not a clear winner that fresh versus frozen is better specifically to overcome the negative impacts from adenomyosis. There are certainly benefits to a frozen transfer that I think have long been well established, elevated progesterone rises, dyssynchrony with the endometrium, yada, 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 yada. But for me, I think it's still very much we're in the shared decision-making phase of if you have adenomyosis and you're wondering when is the best way to put an embryo back into your uterus, there are certain circumstances where fresh still may, may make very good sense for that specific patient. Great. And that's not the only article. There's, uh, there's another one you're going to tell us about. There's also a letter to the editor and a reply from a, an adeno article a couple months ago. So lots of adenomyosis. Tell us about the uh, second one, Pietro. Yeah, I have another adenomyosis article. And if you're a methodological critic, you may have heard my last discussion and thought, what about the confounding by female factors and embryo quality? How does that impact cycle outcomes? We talked a little bit about that, Micah, uh, but specifically other concurrent female factors and embryo quality were not addressed in that first paper. Well, in this month's FNS, I also have the opportunity to answer that for you. This is a study by Mauro Cozzolino from EVRMA in Rome with senior author Caterina Exacostus. 
that sought to evaluate uh, implantation rates and IVF outcomes of patients undergoing their first single embryo transfer in an oocyte donation cycle in relationship to the type, location, and severity of adenomyosis. This was a similar size study, about 228 patients, all under the age of 45 with BMIs under 30, who were uh, taken care of between 2019 and 2023 at a single center. Only first transfers of frozen embryos in a hormone replacement or natural cycle were included. And patients all had an ultrasound diagnosed adenomyosis. The diagnosis, of course, was made by external experts that were blinded to the patient history and outcome. The adenomyosis was classified as focal, diffuse, or adenomyoma, and further categorized with regard to invasion and disease progression. So what did this paper find? Well, first of all, the groups are pretty similar, aside from patients using oocyte donation being on average older and having more of a DOR diagnosis show up. But also, importantly, there was the co-occurrence of endometriosis that showed up again. 17.5% of those with adenomyosis compared to 1.7% in those without. And of course, if you're listening, this is problematic because ultrasound is only really excellent for stage three, stage four diagnosis of endometriosis. It's significantly less good for stage one, stage two, some of that milder superficial peritoneal disease that can certainly coexist but not be easily identified on ultrasound. Now to the study. Implantation rates after first embryo transfer were not statistically significant between groups with and without adenomyosis, 57 versus 53%. There are also no differences in clinical pregnancy or live birth rates. Interestingly, women with adenomyosis had higher rates of miscarriage than those without adenomyosis. This was 34% versus 18%. And again, this is in an oocyte donation cycle. Once a multivariable logistic regression was performed, adenomyosis no longer appeared to impact implantation or live birth rates, but remained an important modifier of miscarriage rate. Now, if you're thinking that's adenomyosis, yes, no. What about the different subgroups of adenomyosis? It doesn't appear to make a difference if it was focal or diffuse, invasive or non-invasive, mild or severe, no impact of adenomyosis on implantation rates, full stop in the adjusted and unadjusted models. However, patients with severe adenomyosis and those with diffuse adenomyosis of the junctional zone specifically appear to have higher risks of miscarriage compared to those without in the adjusted model. That's interesting. So what does one do with all of this? The study suggests that once you isolate issues with embryo quality by utilizing egg donation, the negative effects of adenomyosis on implantation seem to go away. But what remains is an increased miscarriage risk, particularly for patients with more severe presentations of adenomyosis or those involving their junctional zone. Now, why may that be? Probably because there's something going on with decidualization and aberrations in spiral arteries invading and remodeling. And that, when it goes wrong initially, may present as miscarriage risk later in the first trimester. I thought this was really interesting finding. This is something that I've kind of always told patients about. Patients with adenomyosis can experience higher rates of miscarriage. Uh, but it's really nice to see that this kind of played out and have some nuance to that specific patient where it's diffuse adenomyosis and those involving the junctional zone that may be at highest risk for this. Micah, Kate, Kurt, has this kind of been your experience too in your patients undergoing FET with adenomyosis? Do you talk specifically about an elevated miscarriage risk? I think it's consistent with, with the other data that's out there, at least from what I've read, Petra, that yeah, there is an increased risk of, of miscarriage. This, this seems to be supporting the data that's out there with, with a pretty uh, good sample size. It's, it's obviously a hard, hard thing to study with very large samples. So yeah, I think it's something that's worth uh, counseling patients about. Going to say the same thing. I think these data are very helpful for counseling. I wish they were more helpful for fixing. That said, it is consistent with the prior published literature, and and you know patients want to know how is this going to impact my journey. And so I'm grateful to the authors for for conducting the analysis. Yep, well said. All right. Obviously, a hard thing to study both of these adenos with RCTs. We'd love to see clinical trials, but if we thought, you know, we could change pregnancy from 30% to 35% with one of these interventions, we, we need a trial of a couple thousand women. So a uh, very challenging thing to, to get trial data on. Kurt, we are coming to you next. We're staying in the land of ART, but we're talking about risk factors for retained products of conception. Thank you, Micah. I've got an interesting paper titled Assisted Reproductive Technology Associated Risk Factors for Retained Products of Conception. It's out of Japan with the first author, Iwa, and a senior author, 
M-A. My apologies if I didn't have a very good Japanese pronunciation of those names. It's uh, it's an interesting read, but I'm not sure it's going to totally affect your care now. And it, it's bringing us into the journey of does ART have any effect again, possibly through placentation? And I'll go back to that because I don't really know what that how to define that. But um, does the conception with ART affect, in this case, retained products conception? So this is a registry-based study out of the Japanese registry. Uh, it's large. It has um, almost 350,000 singleton live births. And it basically looks at retained products of conception after delivery, um, only in patients conceived with ART, and looks for different risk factors. So the first thing I want to point out is that the actual prevalence of this was actually pretty low. They found that out of all of the deliveries, it was less than 0.4% of patients that actually had retained products conception. Uh, in the introduction of the paper, they thought they were going to find um, an increased risk associated with ART uh, compared to the what they call the, the population baseline, which is about 1%. But take that aside for a second. And what did they actually find? They actually found that they found some significant associations that the, the chances of having retained products conception were higher in frozen embryo transfers, were higher in frozen embryo transfers with hormone replacement therapy, and then a couple other smaller associations that they worked real hard to try to work into their narrative, such as in certain subgroups, um, perhaps it was assisted hatching that may have had an association. So the, the, the study was really looking for what could be driving these factors. One elephant in the room was they found out that retained products conception was severely more commonly found in vaginal deliveries compared to C-sections. In fact, they found um, only one case in the case of a C-section. And that struck me as a little bit odd. Think that why was that? And then I realized that this is the classic definition of a bias in your study. Deliveries are very different in C-sections versus vaginal delivery. In a C-section, they mentioned that they actually can feel um, the, the endometrial cavity. And if there are clots, they actually, in Japan, curette the area of the clot to, to reduce it. Um, retain products conception, whereas obviously you can't do that in a vaginal delivery. So you can't just control for C-section and vaginal delivery. This is a classic example of these are two different delivery modes with very different um, effects on the outcome. Again, classic bias or confounding, depending on your vocabulary there. So it was interesting to go down this journey and think about this. I, again, I'm not sure it's going to change my clinical care. Uh, the associations are relatively small. And while there are some arguments to be made and some hypothesis to be made about differences in hormone replacement cycles versus natural cycles and some differences in assisted hatching. You know, statistically, this wasn't robust to show that those were really strong risk factors. And it goes back to the point I made in the beginning. Overall, they found less retained products conception with ART pregnancies than they thought they were going to have. And again, that may be a classic bias of your, your population or how it's reported. And it shows you that even though you have a huge registry and you do your statistics really carefully, you still might find things you didn't expect. And I enjoyed reading the paper because that was not what they, these authors expected to find. And they, they spent a lot of work trying to say, well, it's still placentation without really knowing what placentation was. Um, there's lots of sections about hypertension disorders and ART still affects how implantation takes place. And I agree with all of that. It's just this study what didn't really you know, knock me over the head with further evidence. But Good read, interesting study, especially if you want to see how to design a study. So I'm glad it was published. That is why it's published. And uh, we'll go from there. What do you guys think of the paper? Kurt, I'm so happy to hear your explanation of that, because when your prevalence is an order of magnitude off what you thought going into it, you know, how, how is that going to affect the outcomes? And I, I think you're, I, I enjoyed hearing your thinking through that. That was, that was fantastic. Pietro, you had a comment. The big elephant in the room here is how they diagnose retained products of conception. There's no description of, of were these patients symptomatic with retained products of conception? Were these screening ultrasounds or saline sonograms that were performed one month after delivery? Just simply says the study was retained products after delivery diagnosed up to one month after delivery. And what's the natural course of retained products after a vaginal delivery? If you were to scan every single patient after a vaginal delivery, what percentage of them will have evidence of something that looks schmutzy within a month after, after delivery? I think that number is actually going to be much higher than we actually think. Um, but I really care about patients who are symptomatic, patients who have persistent bleeding, patients who have something else going on that makes me want to look for a larger amount of retained products. So this is a great example, Pietro. Um, the pros and cons of using a database. So by using a database, you get large numbers and theoretically can get 
real precision in your estimates and really find some things that might drive your hypothesis. The, the disadvantage is the specificity of your diagnosis, right? So I think this was underdiagnosed because all it was was probably a code in the medical record and not the, not the really important questions you're asking. And therefore, that might explain why the prevalence is so low. So this is like a classic epi class of you know, the pros and cons of using registry data, which we do a lot, but you can see the limitations of you know, where it falls short, especially when you don't find what you think you found. And I think for the purposes of the reproductive endocrinologist thinking about retained products of conception, we worry a lot more about first trimester loss and retained products of conception and the ability to manage that quickly, safely, and get them back into their next frozen embryo transfer cycle and how to do that without introducing the iatrogenic harm of Asherman's, chronic endometritis, the time to delay in, in second, F, second FET cycle. That's where retained products really kind of rises to my consciousness, not so much a month after vaginal delivery when they're still under the care of someone else. Yeah, I agree. This, I think this study was trying to put another checkbox in the, you know, categorization that ART has problems with the development of a placenta. And in this case, they, they, they I'm not convinced they found that. Uh, so when, when you look at this in the meta-analysis by, by, you know, by somebody to say whether there's placentation problems, this paper is going to come up negative, but it might come up negative because of the fault of the methodology, not because it, entity doesn't necessarily exist. They found a new benefit for C-section. <laughs> there you go. But please don't quote me on that. <laughs> the C-sections are, are still pretty high. I, you know, years ago when I started doing some research on perinatal outcomes, I was how high the C-section rate was for, for women with ART, um, you know, the, the precious pregnancy. But even in Japan, the, the, the C-sections were, were still, you know, 67% or something like that. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. When you see systematic reviews and meta-analyses, as you're just alluding to, Kurt, at the top of the pyramid, but all they do is uh, combine observational data, obviously they shouldn't be at the top of the pyramid. So there's a lot of issues with what Kurt's alluding to there. There's a great article in Press by Jack Wilkinson on, on the problem of meta-analyses with observational or cohort data that uh, I encourage everyone to read. So, Kurt, we're sticking with you. I'm also very curious, you know, you've done some significant research that's really defined uh, how we look at pregnancies of unknown location and where we can define that it's not going to lead to a live birth. Uh, this is adjacent to that. It's the Poppy Plus tool that's looking at predicting pregnancy after ART. Tell us about this. Yeah, thanks, Micah. For those of you listeners that don't know, Micah and Eve uh, assigned the articles to us. And I was pleased they assigned this one to me because obviously they knew I'd find it of interest because it is kind of in my wheelhouse. So this is the the, the Poppy Plus tool, um, as you alluded to, a prediction model of outcome pregnancy and in vitro fertilization from a large retrospective cohort. It's by authors Murad and Lapenzi out of Ontario, Canada. The goal was to create an accurate predictive model that the patients could use after a positive pregnancy test to see if they actually have a live birth. It's a retrospective cohort, uh, actually combines two cohorts from two different clinics in Montreal, Canada. And let, let me again describe what they're trying to do here. So they have a, um, an online tool that they kind of refined. Um, I don't think the online tool, the Poppy, was originally published, but this, but now they're um, moved to sort of refining it. And the idea is that you can put your numbers in and your risk factors in, and you can get an idea of whether you're going to have live birth or not after you're pregnant with ART. Uh, some of the advantages of this is that um, it's based on live birth, not just pregnancy. Some of you read my work, we always focused on really whether it was it an intrauterine pregnancy, because we were more worried about miscarriage and ectopic pregnancy, not live birth. So it does move things along to that aspect. And the main rationale for this was trying to give clinicians and patients some guidance um, to reduce the stress, you know, after you have a positive pregnancy test, you know, what's the chance that I'm going to have actually a live birth? Statistically, it's an interesting paper because they use lots of different statistical methods um, and, and compared them to see which one was the best one. And they actually showed that even though they used, you know, random tree and open tree analyses and neural networks, um, the, the riding the wave of um, computer learning, they actually found out the logistic regression was still probably the best predictor. That made me happy to think that uh, old time methods are not necessarily eclipsed by fancy names. So what they found was there were basically four variables that could predict uh, whether you're going to have a live birth. One was age, 
That didn't surprise me. Your HCG value, your first HCG value and your second HCG value. And then what did surprise me a little bit was what was the cycle that you got pregnant with? For example, cutting to the chase, that they had lower pregnancy rates if you had a frozen embryo transfer and higher pregnancy rate if you had a fresh embryo transfer. So let me delve into it a little bit because I don't think this is really, well, it's really modifying what we know. It's not really telling us what we know. The first um, variable I want to talk about is age. It didn't surprise me that age is associated with risk of miscarriage. I think we all knew that from a long time ago. What was interesting in this paper was that in a crude analysis, just looking at it alone, age had one of the strongest risk factors. But when you put it in the model with the other variables, age actually dropped out, um, basically showing that it was the HCG values that best predicted pregnancy once you were pregnant. Another way of saying that is while you might have a lower chance of having live birth when you're older, really it's the HCG values that are predicting that actual pregnancy independent of age. Now, there was some comment in a relatively soft association that they said, we did find, although not statistically significant, that the older you were, you actually had a different rate of rise that predicted pregnancy. That fascinated me because when we did our work with HCG values, it evolved over time. First, we said that your HCG rate of rise was dependent on how high your HCG was. We also published a paper that ethnicity mattered, that there was a different rate of rise based on ethnicity. And why that never came into the public domain or why we use it was because it was, a, it was an insignificant statistical finding, meaning it was statistically significant by, by p-values, but it was insignificant in the way you used your HCGs over time. It didn't matter. The, eight, the two HCG values overwhelmed the small statistical significance. And I think it's doing that for age in this as well. We also found out that the, it, it confirms some information that the lower level of their, their HCG change was also, again, 35%, not the 66 by Nicholas Kedar or the, or the 53 that I published at one point, that you really need to lower your rate of HCG to allow all pregnancies a chance to grow. You can't just predict it as abnormal with, with, a, with a relatively low HCG. So that's the kind of final point I wanted to make was, while this was fun, and I hope you understood my statistical jargon, and what are you going to do with this data? So you can you can take this data that I mentioned, you can put it onto the online calculator, and you can, there's a table in here that says, you know, whether you had a frozen embryo transfer or a fresh embryo transfer or your age or your ATG values, and it can give you a prediction of live birth. And the prediction is high in people that had live births, like 75, 90, 80. The prediction is low in those that have miscarriage, like 20. But those are really just numbers and you won't act on them, and it really doesn't really change what you do. In fact, if you look at the actual predictive values, by the way, all these models were based on area under the curve, which I don't like, because an area under curve that they claim 0 0.7, 0 0.75 is really good, it's really not good. It's, it's, it's a poor predictor. That means you're, you're, you're not predicting in 25%. And if you look at the numbers, the true positives and false negatives are Core, you know, the true positives are in the 63, 65% range, and the false negatives are in the 20 to 30% range. So please don't use these numbers to diagnose somebody. All they are is a way of saying, um, I'm pretty, I'm feeling pretty confident, or, oh, I'm really sorry for you. And, you know, we're going to continue following a little bit longer, but yeah, I'm a little bit worried, but I'm going to do the same things. So while a good mathematical exercise this isn't yet moving to um, clinical care in terms of diagnosis. Now, I love the final point they made in their conclusion as a limitations. They set this whole thing up as this is a really stressful time for patients. And if we could give them accurate information and prediction, it would help. And then their final line is, by the way, we didn't test whether this reduced anybody's stress or if anyone liked the model or not. So there is a research project for you all. Do, do patients want to know more than their caring physician says? you know, we're going to continue, there's still the chance, do they really want to know a number that says they're good or bad? Because my inclination is patients don't understand prediction. If you told them there's an 80% prediction it's going to happen, they just like IVF success rates, you know, they're the one in a million. If it's 1%, they're the 1%. Um, if it's an 80% chance of failure, they're not in that group. So I, I love I love that you said that out loud, Kurt, because I think that was the elephant in the room with this study is like we may like to know this in, information and intellectualize it and, and kind of mull it over. And 
I don't know that patients do. I really don't. I think patients um, some blissfully uh, unaware or blissfully kind of removed from the, the nitty gritty data, I think is kind of nice for some patients in these stressful moments. But I don't presume to know what every patient wants. There may be that certain subset of patients who are so data driven and would really like to have the numbers, but this is I, a PCORI, think, this is a PCORI grant rate waiting to be written by someone. So we did a mixed method analysis on patient preferences with pregnancy of unknown location, you know, finding out that patients really find it stressful and what they wanted in treatments. And what amazed me the most, and I love when data makes me think completely opposite of what I thought, was that they didn't want us to tell them what the answer was. They didn't want a number. They felt that you changing your, your tone every time you saw them, like I'm optimistic, you know, I'm pessimistic, drove them crazy. They just, they just wanted to know what the answer was. And unfortunately, these curves and the Poppy Plus doesn't tell them that. It just tells them it's likely or not likely. And I think we already knew that from looking at a whole circumstances. That's what a good clinician does. Kate and I do a lot of research together with our fellows at the NIH, and this exact study has been proposed more than one time by fellows, and we, uh, we've we never really gone with it because of exactly the reasons you're saying, what are you going to do with that information, and, and are you actually helping someone to say you have a 70% chance versus you have a, a 30% chance? Yeah, I think I really we all think say it all the time when counseling patients is that, you know, it's important to know the, the probabilities, but whatever happens to you is 100% for you. There's another way of saying what, what you said, Curtis. It's really important that we meet patients where they are on these questions. That's why I'm continuing to work on diagnostic tests in this area. And again, I don't think an area under the curve of like you get the prediction right 80% of the time is any good. Um, I really think you need really strong, high, in either you're either saying it's normal, you're saying it's not with like you know, 95, 98% accuracy. So hopefully more to follow in this kind of stuff, but interesting read with stats, taught you a little bit more about the early aspects of ACG. So I'm glad it got published. I love that fireside stats with Kurt Barnhart. I mean, that really is the take home on this article. You can't just maximize sensitivity, specificity and say, hey, we have a 0.75 AUC and say, oh, that's a good test. Uh, when, you know, if, if you're going to act on it, you've, you've got to be 99% certain, which I think is what you've done with your PUL studies, Kurt, when you def sort of define those predicting abnormalities there. So the the what you're going to do with the test really determines where, where you need to set that threshold. Great, great discussion. So, Kate, we are coming to you next. And it's another sort of epidemiologic study. What is job control and how does it affect time to pregnancy? Yeah, it's a kind of another variation on a theme. In addition to adenomyosis being a theme of the current issue, I think it's also patient counseling. And so this study addresses a specific angle on a question that we all get frequently from our patients in clinical practice. Um, which is an age old one, does my job related stress impact my chances of successfully conceiving and, and having a baby? You know, the follow on questions being things like, should I take time off work? Should I change to a lower stress job? Should I cut back on my hours? Um, and we really don't have great data with which to guide these patients. So Dr. Erica Sabbath and colleagues from Boston College and Boston University here report their findings on their study that was entitled Association Between Job Control and Time to Pregnancy in a Preconception Cohort. So the study sought to evaluate the association between fecundability and, quote, low job control. And this, uh, when they say low job control here, specifically refers to two particular parameters defined by a matrix that's developed and maintained by the U.S. Department of Labor. And so the first parameter was low job independence, defined as the ability to determine how and when to complete work. So you can kind of think about that as like scheduling flexibility or, you know, you know being in control of your hours. And the second was a freedom to make decisions, which is defined as the ability to make work decisions without others' input or permission. So really, you know, creative capacity in your, in your work. Um, so the authors cite prior literature indicating that low job control, again, low decision authority at work and, and limited latitude to exercise creativity in the workplace, has been linked to a number of adverse health outcomes, including mortality. 
And so they used an online cohort of 7,114 couples with females aged 21 to 45 years old who were working for pay and who had been trying to conceive for less than seven months at the time of enrollment. And so this online cohort was entitled Presto, or, and I like that name, um, uh, the Pregnancy Study Online Ongoing Web-Based Preconception Cohort. And it was derived from um, participants in the United States and Canada. They used a, a number of, of different established criteria to come up with their study methodology. And so they, they looked at the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health Industry and Occupational Computerized Coding System, or NIOCS, N-I-O-C-C-S, to translate the participants' self-reported industry and occupation into standardized occupation codes, or SOCs. And these SOCs were then scored from 1 to 100 using this scale maintained by the U.S. Department of Labor for the two factors previously mentioned, again, job, independence, and freedom to make decisions. So the authors give an example of a university professor as a high independence job and of a restaurant server as a low independence job. And they analyzed only those participants with high competence SOCs, and so again, SOCs being the standardized occupation codes and corresponding scores from the U.S. Department of Labor. And so this yielded a total cohort of 3,110 participants for their final analysis. Fecundability ratios were calculated as the average per cycle probability of conception in the exposed group. So the exposed groups really were each of the lower three quartiles for the two parameters that they were looking at. So again, job independence and freedom to make decisions and compared each of these quartiles to the referent, which is the highest quartile for those parameters. Proportionality, proportional probability regression models accounted for a number of potential covariates. And so specifically, these were age, education, income, intercourse frequency, self-identified race and ethnicity, geographic region, year of study, entry, and whether the participant reported actively trying to improve pregnancy chances. And pregnancy status was obtained by a questionnaire every eight weeks for up to one year or reported pregnancy, whichever came first. So for results, so the authors framed their results as this being a positive study. Essentially, they said, they said that for these two parameters, the lower quartiles, so the exposed groups, had a lower fecundability ratio compared to the referent or the top quartile. However, when you really look at these data more carefully and specifically look at the adjusted models, all of the confidence intervals cross one with the exception of the comparison between the third to lowest quartile for the parameter of job independence when compared to the top quartile. In all of the other comparisons that they made for their outcome of interest or fecundability ratio, the confidence intervals cross one. So while on the one hand, um, I, I certainly agree with them that it is of the utmost importance to improve folks' job working conditions and job satisfaction to the extent that we can do so. And that's a whole other question, to what extent can we do so? You know, I really take these data as primarily reassuring for telling my patients that, listen, uh, you don't need to take off work probably and do everything you can to improve your quality of life at work. And if I could convince folks' bosses to treat them well, I certainly would. But this is a, a pretty modest effect size or a correlation that we're seeing here in this study. So I thought it was an interesting study. And overall, you know, it kind of supports what I often tell my patients, which is that people have gotten pregnant harvesting the fields for thousands of years. Um, and, you know, it, it, it really is important, I guess, to some extent to take care of oneself, um, but also not to stress about your stress. And so I think it's a useful counseling tool in that way. So do you think that this is, in fact, a reassuring study, or do you feel that you would counsel your patients that having low job independence really is going to markedly negatively impact their ability to conceive? I think a little bit of it is just kind of the practicality of, are you and your partner at, at home at the same time, at the right time in your cycle to maximize chances of conception each month? And 
take care of a lot of physician couples where call schedules differ, and uh, that can be tricky. Um, long distance couples, people who drive trucks for a living and miss large chunks of, of the week, being away from home, um, I can certainly see how this data plays, plays out, and I, I've seen that in my patients. I want to just give a shout out to the folks at Presto. Presto has been, I think, one of those gems in our field run out of Boston University's Public Health School. Lauren Wise and her group have just consistently pumped out really outstanding data for many, many years from this cohort that they've carefully managed and tracked and kind of done new and different things to answer some thoughtful questions. So big shout out to the Presto team. So, Micah, I think I would add to this is that, again, let the data wash over you. I think we all are looking for some confirmation that stress somehow affects fertility in a way that we can't really define. And this is another example of that, I think, because what they're trying to say is if you don't have independence in your job, you've got more stress. But I'm not sure I would tell a patient that because what are you going to do? Say, get a different job? I mean, you, you have to take this information and say, I, I think that stress might matter and we do everything possible to reduce it. And this is another example of that. But I don't think we can say definitively, you know, people with bad jobs aren't going to get pregnant. Great. Uh, thank you, Kate. Another uh, very good article. So we have one more left that we're going to talk about. Uh, we're moving now to the uh, research letters. So these are the uh, shorter research articles. This one's titled Sperm Retrieval Outcomes of Contralateral Testes in Men with Non-Obstructive Azospermia After Unsuccessful Unilateral Microtessy. Uh, so this is a group of authors, uh, first author Zhang, senior author Zhao out of China. This was a retrospective cohort study. And essentially what they were looking at was in men who on the first side, first testicle of their uh, microtessy, you didn't get sperm. What were the chances of finding sperm on the contralateral sides when they moved to the second testes? They had 2,500 microtesses in a six year period. So this is obviously a pretty busy practice. And of those half, they didn't find sperm on the first side. And so that was the 1,300 that were included in this retrospective cohort. So their main question was, what was the prevalence of finding sperm on that second side? And it was 11%. So basically one out of nine. So pretty low. The second question they looked at was more of a sort of case control design. Look, looking backwards then, if you did find sperm, what were the things that helped you predict that you would find sperm? The biggest one was Kleinfelter's. Uh, and the second biggest one was why microdeletions. So with Kleinfelters, 43% of them were able to find sperm on that second side. And uh, with why microdeletion, it was 22%. Uh, so those seem to be the patients that are more most likely to have sort of very small focal spermatogenesis uh, somewhere within the contralateral testes. Uh, so that was it. It's a very short and simple study, as the research letters are. I appreciate it for that. I think one of the themes for today is there's science. It's good to know. It's maybe helpful for counseling. How would this actually change what you're going to do? Because I think most patients uh, going into a TESI are generally going to talk about doing the second side if the first side doesn't yield any sperm. Kate, Pietro, Kurt, thoughts on that? Clinically useful paper, for sure. We hate to have patients wake up from their respective retrievals and hear that unfortunately we need backup donor sperm or we need to freeze all of the eggs so it's helpful to know that the efforts are have a reasonable chance of being rewarded to to keep on looking in these patients follow-up question to that is if uh, there's an 11 percent chance of finding sperm at the contralateral side what does it do to the increased risk of gonadal failure mm -hmm. um, hypogonadism by nature of looking in that second side I, I wish they had published a little bit on that but i know that's tougher to ascertain I also want to make a shout out to the article type because I still think the research letter is unknown to many people and perhaps many of our listeners. The research letter is a short, concise presentation of novel research findings. It could be a secondary analysis. It could be just a very short question that could be answered in, in a small amount of words. But I want to let you know, as pleasant as that was to read and teach us something in a short amount, it is a full article in FNS with um full references in PubMed. It is a full article. It's just a matter of writing it concisely when findings can be written concisely. Yeah, Kurt, this is one of my favorite things. You've done a lot of amazing things as editor-in-chief, but this is one of my favorite that you've done is bringing this article type back. Uh, as an example, Kate and I published a secondary analysis of the synchrony trial. 
which was in JAMA and, and is a perfect place to put that, the secondary analysis and FNS uh, looking at that. So home for these. And I really like reading them because they're very to the point. Uh, there's not a lot of extraneous material you have to sort of get through to get, get to the main question that the article is asking. I think they're fantastic. When some people get a letter that you know, we want to convert your full manuscript to a research letter, it's not because we think it's low quality. It's because we think you can just say it concisely and in a short manner and actually then perhaps bring more attention to it. So don't disregard that advice when you get it. I couldn't agree more. I've had this happen on a couple of our submissions and the fellow wants to transfer to another journal and they say, no, no, it's a good thing. Absolutely. hundred percent. As always, we are only talking about some of the great content in the journal this month. There's a lot of really good other content, letters to the editors, good reflections in his typical provocative self. Alan DeCherney's reflection is the fetus need not be an anti-vaxxer. So that was based on that first article, the seminal article on COVID that we talked about. Uh, a lot of good information in there. I want to give a shout out to Adriana Wong, our producer of FNS On Air. Thank you for all you do, Adriana, to make these episodes so great. And for all of our listeners, please like and subscribe to FNS On Air, wherever you may be listening or getting your podcast from. We will see you again next month. Thank you. Kudos to the team. I was in uh, India at the ISAR meeting just last week, and our podcast is even reaching audiences there. Uh, many people came up to us saying it's a wonderful way to keep aggressive literature. And um, I just wanted to say thank you to the team and thank you to the listeners. Outstanding. Thank you, everyone. Have a great March, and we'll see you back in April. This concludes our episode of Fertility and Sterility on Air, brought to you by Fertility and Sterility in conjunction with the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. This podcast is produced by Dr. Molly Cornfield and Dr. Adriana Wong. This podcast was developed by Fertility and Sterility and the American Society for Reproductive Medicine as an educational resource and service to its members and other practicing clinicians. While the podcast reflects the views of the authors and the hosts, it is not intended to be the only approved standard of practice or to direct an exclusive course of treatment. The opinions expressed are those of the discussants and do not reflect fertility and sterility or the American Society for Reproductive Medicine.